on this Tuesday night, Israel's dire prediction for its war against Hamas as more blood is shed. This war has necessary and not easy goals to achieve. Plus, what Israel is now denying to UN workers and why. The struggle to own a home, what economists say is needed to raise affordability. High-tech help for health care, how doctors, nurses and patients could benefit from artificial intelligence. Plus, five decades of frightening audiences and spinning heads. <laughs> what inspired The Exorcist and how it revolutionized the horror genre? Global National with Donna Friesen, reporting tonight, Neetu Garcha. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We are less than a week away from the new year, yet there are no signs the crisis in the Middle East after Hamas's attack on Israel on October 7th is any closer to being resolved. Today, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned Hamas that Israel has fighters on the ground, sometimes underground, and eyes in the sky as their siege on Gaza continues that they will fight until the end with the help of the most advanced technology. This is despite the already staggering level of destruction and suffering in Gaza from the assault, with more than 20,000 Palestinians killed, according to its Hamas-run health ministry. On Monday, Egypt presented its own proposal for a permanent ceasefire. It would see all of Hamas's hostages released in return for Israel freeing more Palestinian prisoners. But Hamas rejected the plan, which also conflicted with Israel's goals of eradicating the armed group. And as Redmond Shannon reports in our top story tonight, there are more signs the region's instability could grow even wider. The season of goodwill in the Holy Land where despair and death persist. Israel's bombing and ground campaigns claim more lives in Gaza and displace more Gazans. This woman says Israel should confront resistance fighters, not civilians like her family member. Israel insists it does not target civilians. Hamas figures say more than 20,000 people have been killed since October 7th. Israel's defense minister says Gaza is one of seven fronts on which Israel is now fighting. There is the occupied West Bank, the skirmishes against Hezbollah in Lebanon, and actors in Iran, Iraq, Syria and Yemen. Yoav Gallant says Israel has taken action on six of those seven fronts. He did not elaborate, but it's a strong suggestion from Israel that it has struck against Iranian-backed targets inside Iraq or Yemen or possibly Iran itself. Iran, meanwhile, has vowed revenge for Monday's suspected Israeli airstrike in Syria that killed this senior Iranian commander. Also, the UN's Atomic Energy Agency said Tuesday Iran is reversing its decision to slow down its enrichment of uranium. And in neighboring Iraq, the United States bombed targets after recent attacks on its air bases in Iraq and Syria. The simmering tensions in the region are doing little to help any prospect of peace in Gaza. And Israel's government is increasingly frustrated with what it sees as a lack of support from the international community. Now saying it will no longer automatically grant visas to United Nations workers. For too long, international officials have been deflecting blame onto Israel to cover up for the fact that they are covering up for Hamas in failing to condemn Hamas for hijacking aid and failing to condemn it for waging war out of hospitals, they have been complicit partners in Hamas's human shield strategy. And the head of Israel's armed forces echoed Monday's statement from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Herzi Halevi told Israeli journalists that the war will continue for many months. Nitu? Redmond Shannon in London. Thanks, Redmond. Ukraine has claimed responsibility for an attack on a warship in Russia-controlled Crimea overnight, killing at least one person. 
Ukrainian military officials say they fired cruise missiles to destroy the large landing ship. Russia's defense ministry says the vessel, which can transport tanks, armored vehicles and troops, was only damaged. It's the latest in a series of attacks on Russia's Black Sea fleet in Crimea throughout its invasion of Ukraine. And in Russia, one of the president's loudest critics is sounding off on social media after weeks of worry about his sudden disappearance. Alexei Navalny confirms he's now in a penal colony north of the Arctic Circle, joking his new location makes him the new Santa Claus. The move to one of Russia's toughest prisons took what Navalny calls an exhausting 20 days, but he says he's fine. He's serving sentences totaling more than 30 years on extremism and misdemeanor charges which are widely criticized as bogus. Back in this country, with Christmas now over, many Canadians are looking to take advantage of this holiday season's last bargains for Boxing Day. It's another welcome but brief reprieve as consumers complain about rising retail prices. Sean O'Shea takes a look at how deal-hungry shoppers fared across the country. It's an annual Canadian ritual, Boxing Day shopping. And in a year where a lot of people have been feeling financial strains, the lure of discounts is an excuse for many to seek bargains. People like bargains. People like to get something where they think they're getting a great price. And so it, it is a way to get people into stores. And one of the things is that when you get people into stores, they tend to buy more. Malls across the country, Boxing Day sales are seen as a last chance to get the season's best deals. Many consumers uh, were disappointed with the Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals, so they will definitely be looking for deeper discounts. That's what we're looking for, hopefully. But whatever, if they like it and it makes sense, we get it. The hunt to make their dollars go farther. Some of the deals that we're going to look for are maybe things that are like 50% off. Like, I want to see the big deals. Some are finding that. Did you get a good deal? Yeah, a good deal, yeah. Ah, uh, it's around like 50% like off. In Montreal, others were disappointed. Not as cheap as I was expecting. But when you're spending money that's a gift, it's a different story. I did just get some birthday money, so I feel more inclined to spend my money. In Alberta, where there's no provincial sales tax, dollars get stretched a little farther. People really seem to just be in, a, in great spirits and great mood. And this season, retail watchers say there's a move back to in-store shopping, away from online. We really think that there's been all this push about the demise of the brick and mortar store and that everybody is shopping online, but we are actually seeing a real comeback. I like always like personal touch with the people at the same time you can feel the product. With so many sales leading up to Christmas, Boxing Day doesn't have the same allure it once did. But experts say it's still key to retailers, especially hoping to move winter merchandise when it's still cold outside. Sean O'Shea, Global News, Toronto. One of the reasons behind all that bargain hunting, Canadians are spending more on housing. It now takes 63% of median family income to own a home in Canada. That's much higher than the 30% that most financial experts consider affordable. It's a problem that has attracted all sorts of new programs and spending announcements to increase the housing supply. But as Mackenzie Gray tells us, the factors leading to the spike in shelter costs are not easy to fix. It's a top complaint around the Christmas dinner table, the skyrocketing cost of housing. And a new report from Canada's largest bank outlines just how unaffordable home ownership is across the country. It actually reached like the, the, the highest level ever and as measure against uh, a household's income. RBC crunched the numbers and only 26% of Canadian households can afford to purchase a single family home. 45% could opt for a condo but when you break it down regionally, the picture looks even worse in big cities. In Vancouver, it would take 102% of the median Canadian income to be a buyer. In Toronto, it's 84%. And even in famously affordable Montreal, it takes over 50% of a regular salary to get into the market. And there's only a few ways that will change. What we'll need is significantly lower um, interest rate. We need prices to uh, at least stabilize, if not decline, over the coming uh, uh, months. But a drop in house prices in major markets seem unlikely. The Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation reporting new housing construction dropped 22 percent in November, and it's poised to trend down in the new year. We're starting to see even those big projects now uh, slowing down quite a lot. So I think we should probably see starts uh, being impacted by that context. 
While supply is dropping, demand for housing is at its highest level in decades. A new report from the Bank of Canada estimates an additional 200,000 homes, 10 months worth of supply, needs to be built on top of current levels just to keep up with Canada's rocketing temporary immigration admissions. These two issues have been increasingly tied together and there is obviously a correlation we need to look at. The Liberals have announced new housing measures to build just over 1 million new units, but that commitment is spread out over 10 years. In the short term, Canada's population grew by a staggering 430,000 from July to September alone. That's like adding a city the size of Victoria in just three months. I think people can expect further steps in the new year to curb that. Another factor to likely be reined in, interest rates, with most big banks projecting cuts starting in the middle of 2024, which should make housing costs more affordable. But even then, RBC projects new buyers will have to spend upwards of 50% of their income to get into the housing market. Mackenzie Gray, Global News, Ottawa. Rising on the right. Coming up, what federal conservative leader Pierre Polyev might have to do to maintain his growing popularity. Police in Denver say they're investigating incidents directed at Colorado Supreme Court justices and providing extra patrols around their homes following the court's decision to remove former President Donald Trump from the state's presidential primary ballot. The FBI confirms it's involved as well and would vigorously pursue investigations of any threat or use of violence. No other details are being released. Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives started the year tied in the polls with Justin Trudeau and the Liberals. Now the opposition leader is finishing with a commanding lead. So what does uh, bring it home mean to me? Polyev released a new video on social media today. It's his latest attempt to connect with voters. Our chief political correspondent David Aiken looks at how Polyev has built support and what he needs to do to keep it in 2024. Thank you and I welcome your questions. He bristles at some questions. Actually you're wrong. Are you a CP? And prefers speaking directly to voters. Who's ready for some common sense? <laughs> either at the dozens of rallies he held in 2023 across the country or via video distributed on social media platforms. A lot of people would, would say that you're simply taking a page out of the Donald Trump uh, Probably book. like which people would say that? Pierre Polyev's Okanagan apple orchard interview went viral, as did this online video, 15 minutes long, on Canada's housing crisis, which Polyev narrated. An entire generation of youth now say they will never be able to afford a home. This is not normal for Canada. However he did it, it has paid off in voter support. Sure, they talk about other stuff here and there, but for the most part, they're super focused and they're super simple in their message. They've definitely shown uh, a willingness to innovate and just try different types of social media and different types of videos, uh, which is just a good thing you want to see from an opposition party. The Conservatives finished 2023 with a commanding double-digit lead in the polls, having raised more money through the year than all other parties combined. And Polyev himself was named Newsmaker of the Year by the Canadian Press, the very news organization he goes out of his way to taunt. Everything feels broken in Canada. But of course, there may not be an election until the fall of 2025. That's a long time for the Conservatives to maintain the momentum built in 2023. It's not like people have cast a ballot for him yet, so they could certainly change their minds just as easily as they have moved towards his direction. And I think that's um, you know, the risk that uh, he faces over the next year. It's like we saw with with the CP journalists recently, like we've seen in, in other ways where he just gets like, um, uh, he has those little snide comments um, in the house or, or in scrums or whatever it is. Um, those parts are what will get him in trouble. One way the Conservatives can maintain momentum in 2024 is by nominating so-called star candidates. Stephen Harper did that ahead of the 2005 election. Justin Trudeau did it in 2015, bringing on the likes of Christian Freeland and Bill Morneau. Adding some big-name candidates to Poilier's team is likely the party's next step as it prepares for 2025. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. Modernizing medicine ahead, how healthcare is embracing artificial intelligence. 
Many industries are starting to take advantage of artificial intelligence, including medicine. Doctors say the technology can help improve patient care and be a difference maker in life or death scenarios. Catherine Ward explains how Canada's largest network of research hospitals is incorporating AI into its workflow. Chief AI scientist Bo Wang is on a quest to figure out how to maximize artificial intelligence to help patients. I think that when it comes to AI for healthcare, the keywords is not replacement, the keywords is enhancement. One new language learning model Wang has been working on is a chat GPT-like tool called Clinical Camel. And once I ask this question, uh, the Clinical Camel will pr process uh, this information and uh, uh, respond with the most accurate response it can generate. It's not meant to replace doctors, but rather to support them. We can use Clinical Camel to improve doctors' uh, workflow efficiency and really reduce the burnout for doctors and nurses. Dr. Shaf Kishavji is a thoracic surgeon and appreciates how AI could reshape medicine. If it could listen to your conversation, unjumble it and put it in a structured clinical note and not miss any important points, or maybe remind you that you forgot an important point, can you remember to ask that? Then you've saved me 15, 20 minutes on each patient I see. That's huge. Wang is also looking at how to leverage AI for medical imaging. Instead of a technician manually isolating elements on a scan, AI could do this more quickly. They can segment all the organs of interest or tumors and lesions uh, with accurate measurements within seconds. Surgeons at UHN are also using algorithms to help determine if an organ is viable for transplant. Only 20% of lungs that are available from donors worldwide are actually transplanted. So 80% are not transplanted because we don't know. We can't be sure enough that it's okay. And while there are concerns about privacy and misuse, these experts say charting a responsible way forward is paramount. It's like a scalpel. It, it, you use it precisely, but it can do a lot of damage. And I want to be part of the solution. Not turning our back on it, saying, how do we harness this and how do we do it safely? Catherine Ward, Global News. The puck has dropped at the World Junior Hockey Championship in Sweden and Canada's gold medal defense is off to a great start. Plays it back for Lambert with a shot. Rebound score! They've got through Congo and Canada opens the score. Canada grabbed the lead early and never let go, ending the night with a 5-2 win over Finland to open the tournament. Canada's next game is against Latvia tomorrow. Horror hysteria next. How the exorcist took the world by storm 50 years ago. It's the power. Holy water. It's the power of Christ that compares you. Exactly 50 years ago today, the film that redefined fright, The Exorcist, hit the big screen and sent moviegoers into a frenzy. Jackson Prosco reports on the real-life story and places that inspired what's still considered the greatest horror movie of all time. This is the very real corner of Washington, D.C., that inspired one of the scariest movies ever made, The Exorcist. Who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, Damien. The 1973 film changed everything about what we consider horrifying, with the story of a little girl possessed by a demon and saved by a Catholic priest performing a sacred rite. It's good against evil and it's a demon being driven out and it's horrible things that are happening to this girl and terrifying effects and you totally just buy into this good against evil and you know the light against the dark. Matt Lolich hosts the Scary Movie Project podcast. Everything was new, right? All that stuff was new. No one had seen a real horror like that before, right? He so takes Exorcist fans on tours of the film's famous locations, like the epic steps no! from the film's final scene. After 50 years, this place is still incredible. I mean, even if you haven't seen this film, you know what these stairs are, you know what this place is. At the top of those long stairs, there's the actual house that was modified for the film. What they did was they built a facade, a taller roof on top, 
and they also built a fake front facade to come out this way. The exorcist is still drawing sellout houses. For but what people may not realize is that 50 years ago, the exorcist inspired real fear. I fainted like 10 minutes after the first beginning of the movie. News reports were filled with distraught filmgoers. My legs are just going Who fainted in the aisles and became ill during the movie. Do you remember what scene it was that affected you so much? Convulsions, when she took convulsions. Because I have a little girl. Toronto's University Theatre kept police on standby to make sure no minors saw the film. Exorcist hysteria gripped the Catholic Church and the public. And it's so powerful and it becomes a real message because it's just this awful evil being done to this poor little girl. So much of the fright factor came from a plot that almost seemed plausible based on this 1949 Washington Post story about a boy reported held in the devil's grip. That story was the basis for the book and the screenplay written by William Peter Blatty, a student at Georgetown University, a Jesuit school where much of the film is set. Blatty wrote this because of this setting, right? He knew what he was writing he, and he knew he wanted it here. The Exorcist went on to make history as the first horror movie nominated for the Best Picture Academy Award. Hey, where'd this come from? Adjusted for inflation, okay. it was the highest grossing Warner Brothers film until the release of Barbie. There were multiple sequels and imitators. The original is still the fan favorite. Do you think it holds up 50 years later? I think it absolutely holds up. We're standing here right now talking about it, aren't we? Sure enough, fans kept showing up to snap pictures of those famous stairs. A film that scared, or perhaps scarred, a generation of moviegoers still turns heads half a century later. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. It certainly does. I can say I was too young when I first watched that one. That is Global National for this Tuesday. I'm Neetu Garcha. Tonight's Your Canada is this pair of wolf dogs in Cochrane, Alberta. Thanks so much for watching. Colleen Christie will be at the anchor desk tomorrow. Have a great night.